There is this pervasive idea that the successful person is the disciplined person who leads a disciplined life. It's a lie. The truth is we don't need any more discipline than we already have. We just need to direct and manage it a little better. Contrary to what most people believe, success is not a marathon of disciplined action. Achievement doesn't require you to be a full-time disciplined person where your every action is trained and where control is the solution to every situation. Success is actually a short race, a sprint fueled by discipline just long enough for habit to kick in and take over. When we know something that needs to be done but isn't currently getting done, we often say, I just need more discipline. Actually, we need the habit of doing it, and we need just enough discipline to build the habit. In any discussion about success, the words discipline and habit ultimately intersect. Though separate in meaning, they powerfully connect to form the foundation for achievement, regularly working at something until it regularly works for you. When you discipline yourself, you're essentially training yourself to act in a specific way. Stay with this long enough and it becomes routine. In other words, a habit. So when you see people who look like disciplined people, what you're really seeing is people who've trained a handful of habits into their lives. This makes them seem disciplined when actually they're not. No one is. And who would want to be anyway? The very thought of having your every behavior molded and maintained by training seems frighteningly impossible on one hand and utterly boring on the other. Most people ultimately reach this conclusion but seeing no alternative, redouble their efforts at the impossible or quietly quit. Frustration shows up and resignation eventually sets in. You don't need to be a disciplined person to be successful. In fact, you can become successful with less discipline than you think for one simple reason. Success is about doing the right thing, not about doing everything right. The trick to success is to choose the right habit and bring just enough discipline to establish it. That's it. That's all the discipline you need. As this habit becomes a part of your life, you'll start looking like a disciplined person, but you won't be one. What you will be is someone who has something regularly working for you because you regularly worked on it. You'll be a person who used selected discipline to build a powerful habit. Selected discipline works swimmingly. Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps is a case study of selected discipline. When he was diagnosed with ADHD as a child, his kindergarten teacher told his mother, Michael can't sit still. Michael can't be quiet. He's not gifted. Your son will never be able to focus on anything. Bob Bowman, his coach since age 11, reports that Michael spent a lot of time on the side of the pool by the lifeguard stand for disruptive behavior. That same misbehavior has cropped up from time to time in his adult life as well. Yet he set dozens of world records. In 2004, he won six gold and two bronze medals in Athens, and then in 2008, a record eight in Beijing, surpassing the legendary Mark Spitz. His 18 gold medals set a record for Olympians in any sport. Before he hung up his goggles in retirement, his wins at the 2012 London Olympic Games brought his total medal count to 22 and earned him the status of most decorated Olympian in any sport in history. Talking about Phelps, one reporter said, if he were a country, he'd be ranked 12th over the last three Olympics. Today, his mom reports, Michael's ability to focus amazes me. Bowman calls it his strongest attribute. How did this happen? How did the boy, who would never be able to focus on anything, achieve so much? Phelps became a person of selected discipline. From age 14 through the Beijing Olympics, Phelps trained seven days a week, 365 days a year. He figured that by training on Sundays, he got a 52 training day advantage on the competition. He spent up to six hours in the water each day. Channeling his energy is one of his greatest strengths, said Bowman. Not to oversimplify, 
but it's not a stretch to say that Phelps channeled all of his energy into one discipline that developed into one habit, a habit of swimming daily. The payoff from developing the right habit is pretty obvious. It gets you the success you're searching for. What sometimes gets overlooked, however, is an amazing windfall. It also simplifies your life. Your life gets clearer and less complicated because you know what you have to do well and you know what you don't. The fact of the matter is that aiming discipline at the right habit gives you license to be less disciplined in other areas. When you do the right thing, it can liberate you from having to monitor everything. Michael Phelps found his sweet spot in the swimming pool. Over time, finding the discipline to do this formed the habit that changed his life. 66 Days to the Sweet Spot Discipline and Habit Honestly, most people never really want to talk about these. And who can blame them? I don't either. The images these words conjure in our heads are of something hard and unpleasant. Just reading the words is exhausting. But there's good news. The right discipline goes a long way, and habits are hard only in the beginning. Over time, the habit you're after becomes easier and easier to sustain. It's true. Habits require much less energy and effort to maintain than to begin. Online at theonething.com, Figure 7 shows a graphical representation of the role of discipline in achievement where less discipline is needed to maintain a behavior once it becomes a habit. Put up with the discipline long enough to turn it into a habit and the journey feels different. Lock in one habit so it becomes part of your life and you can effectively ride the routine with less wear and tear on yourself. The hard stuff becomes habit and habit makes the hard stuff easy. So how long do you have to maintain discipline? Researchers at the University College of London have the answer. In 2009, they asked the question, how long does it take to establish a new habit? They were looking for the moment when a new behavior becomes automatic or ingrained. The point of automaticity came when participants were 95% through the power curve and the effort needed to sustain it was about as low as it would get. They asked students to take on exercise and diet goals for a period of time and monitor their progress. The results suggest that it takes an average of 66 days to acquire a new habit. The full range was 18 to 254 days, but the 66 days represented a sweet spot, with easier behaviors taking fewer days on average and tough ones taking longer. Self-help circles tend to preach that it takes 21 days to make a change, but modern science doesn't back that up. It takes time to develop the right habit, so don't give up too soon. Decide what the right one is, then give yourself all the time you need and apply all the discipline you can summon to develop it. Australian researchers Megan Oten and Ken Cheng have even found some evidence of a halo effect around habit creation. In their studies, students who successfully acquired one positive habit reported less stress, less impulsive spending, better dietary habits, decreased alcohol, tobacco and caffeine consumption, fewer hours watching TV, and even fewer dirty dishes. Sustain the discipline long enough on one habit, and not only does it become easier, but so do other things as well. It's why those with the right habits seem to do better than others. They're doing the most important thing regularly, and as a result, everything else is easier. Think of it this way. Every level of achievement requires its own combination of what you do, how you do it, and who you do it with. The trouble is that the combination of what, how, and who that gets you to one level of success won't naturally evolve to a better combination that leads to the next level of success. Doing something one way doesn't always lay the foundation for doing something better, nor does a relationship with one person automatically set the stage for a more successful relationship with another. It's unfortunate, but these things don't build on each other. If you learn to do something one way and with one set of relationships, that may work fine until you want to achieve more. 
It's then that you'll discover you've created an artificial ceiling of achievement for yourself that may be too hard to break through. In effect, you've boxed yourself in when there is a simple way to avoid it. Think as big as you possibly can and base what you do, how you do it and who you do it with on succeeding at that level. It just might take you more than your lifetime to run into the walls of a box this big. When people talk about reinventing their career or their business, small boxes are often the root cause. What you build today will either empower or restrict you tomorrow. It will either serve as a platform for the next level of your success or as a box trapping you where you are. Thomas Henry Huxley said, The rung of a ladder was never meant to rest upon, but only to hold a man's foot long enough to enable him to put the other somewhat higher. Big gives you the best chance for extraordinary results today and tomorrow. When Arthur Guinness set up his first brewery, he signed a 9,000-year lease. When J.K. Rowling conceived Harry Potter, she thought big and envisioned seven years at Hogwarts before she penned the first chapter of the first seven books. Before Sam Walton opened the first Walmart, he envisioned a business so big that he felt he needed to go ahead and set up his future estate plan to minimize inheritance taxes. By thinking big, long before he made it big, he was able to save his family an estimated 11 to 13 billion dollars in estate taxes. Transferring the wealth of one of the greatest companies ever built as tax-free as possible requires thinking big from the beginning. Thinking big isn't just about business. Candace Leitner started Mothers Against Drunk Driving in 1980 after her daughter was killed in a hit-and-run accident by a drunk driver. Today, MAD has saved more than 300,000 lives. As a six-year-old in 1998, Ryan Reljack was inspired by stories told by his teacher to help bring clean water to Africa. Today, his foundation, Ryan's Well, has improved conditions and helped bring safe water to over 750,000 people in 16 countries. Derek Kayongo recognized both the waste and hidden value in getting new soap into hotels every day. So in 2009, he created the Global Soap Project, which has provided more than 250,000 bars of soap in 21 countries helping combat child mortality by simply giving impoverished people the chance to wash their hands. Asking big questions can be daunting. Big goals can seem unattainable at first. Yet how many times have you set out to do something that seemed like a real stretch at the time, only to discover it was much easier than you thought? Sometimes things are easier than we imagine, and truthfully, sometimes they're a lot harder. That's when it's important to realize that on the journey to achieving big, you get bigger. Big requires growth, and by the time you arrive, you're big too. What seemed an insurmountable mountain from a distance is just a small hill when you arrive, at least in proportion to the person you've become. Your thinking, your skills, your relationships, your sense of what is possible and what it takes all grow on the journey to big. As you experience big, you become big. The Big Deal For more than four decades, Stanford psychologist Carol S. Dweck has studied the science of how our self-conceptions influence our actions. Her work offers great insight into why thinking big is such a big deal. Dweck's work with children revealed two mindsets in action a growth mindset that generally thinks big and seeks growth, and a fixed mindset that places artificial limits and avoids failure. Growth-minded students, as she calls them, employ better learning strategies, experience less helplessness, exhibit more positive effort, and achieve more in the classroom than their fixed-minded peers. They are less likely to place limits on their lives and more likely to reach for their potential. Dweck points out that mindsets can and do change. Like any other habit, you set your mind to it until the right mindset becomes routine.
When Scott Forstall started recruiting talent to his newly formed team, he warned that the top secret project would provide ample opportunities to make mistakes and struggle. But, he said, eventually we may do something that we'll remember the rest of our lives. He gave this curious pitch to superstars across the company, but only took those who immediately jumped at the challenge. He was looking for growth-minded people, as he later shared with Dweck after reading her book. Why is this significant? While you've probably never even heard of Forstall, you've certainly heard of what his team created. Forstall was a senior vice president at Apple, and the team he formed created the iPhone. Blowing up your life. Big stands for greatness, meaning extraordinary results. Pursue a big life, and you're pursuing the greatest life you can possibly live. To live great, you have to think big. You must be open to the possibility that your life and what you accomplish can become great. Achievement and abundance show up because they're the natural outcomes of doing the right things with no limits attached. Don't fear big. Fear mediocrity. Fear waste. Fear the lack of living to your fullest. When we fear big, we either consciously or subconsciously work against it. We either run toward lesser outcomes and opportunities, or we simply run away from the big ones. And last, multitaskers experience more life-reducing, happiness-squelching stress. With research overwhelmingly clear, it seems insane that knowing how multitasking leads to mistakes, poor choices, and stress, we attempt it anyway. Maybe it's just too tempting. Workers who use computers during the day change windows or check email or other programs nearly 37 times an hour. Being in a distractible setting sets us up to be more distractible. Or maybe it's the high. Medium multitaskers actually experience a thrill with switching, a burst of dopamine that can be addictive. Without it, they can feel bored. For whatever the reason, the results are unambiguous. Multitasking slows us down and makes us slower-witted. Driven to Distraction In 2009, New York Times reporter Matt Richtel earned a Pulitzer Prize for national reporting with Driven to Distraction, a series of articles on the dangers of driving while texting or using cell phones. He found that distracted driving is responsible for 16% of all traffic fatalities and nearly half a million injuries annually. Even an idle phone conversation when driving takes a 40% bite out of your focus and, surprisingly, can have the same effect as being drunk. The evidence is so compelling that many states and municipalities have outlawed cell phone use while driving. This makes sense. Though some of us at times have been guilty, we'd never condone it for our teenage kids. All it takes is a text message to turn the family SUV into a deadly two-ton battering ram. Multitasking can cause more than one type of wreck. We know that multitasking can even be fatal when lives are at stake. In fact, we fully expect pilots and surgeons to focus on their jobs to the exclusion of everything else. And we expect that anyone in their position who gets caught doing otherwise will always be taken severely to task. We accept no arguments and have no tolerance for anything but total concentration from these professionals. And yet, here the rest of us are, living another standard. Do we not value our own job or take it as seriously? Why would we ever tolerate multitasking when we're doing our most important work? Just because our day job doesn't involve bypass surgery shouldn't make focus any less critical to our success or the success of others. Your work deserves no less respect. It may not seem so in the moment, but the connectivity of everything we do ultimately means that we each not only have a job to do, but a job that deserves to be done well. Think of it this way. If we really lose almost a third of our workday to distractions, what is the cumulative loss over a career? What is the loss to other careers, to businesses? When you think about it, 
you might just discover that if you don't figure out a way to resolve this, you could in fact lose your career or your business, or worse, cause others to lose theirs. On top of work, what sort of toll do our distractions take on our personal lives? Author Dave Crenshaw put it just right when he wrote, The people we live with and work with on a daily basis deserve our full attention. When we give people segmented attention, piecemeal time, switching back and forth, the switching cost is higher than just the time involved. We end up damaging relationships. Every time I see a couple dining with one partner trying earnestly to communicate while the other is texting under the table, I'm just as with the sayings, the early bird gets the worm and make hay while the sun shines, willpower is a timing issue. When you have your will, you get your way. Although character is an essential element of willpower, the key to harnessing it is when you use it. Renewable Energy Think of willpower like the power bar on your cell phone. Every morning you start out with a full charge. As the day goes on, every time you draw on it, you're using it up. So as your green bar shrinks, so does your resolve. And when it eventually goes red, you're done. Willpower has a limited battery life, but can be recharged with some downtime. It's a limited but renewable resource. Because you have a limited supply, each act of will creates a win-lose scenario, where willing in an immediate situation through willpower makes you more likely to lose later because you have less of it. Make it through a tough day in the trenches, and the lure of late night snacking can become your diet's downfall. Everyone accepts that limited resources must be managed, yet we fail to recognize that willpower is one of them. We act as though our supply of willpower were endless. As a result, we don't consider it a personal resource to be managed, like food or sleep. This repeatedly puts us in a tight spot. But when we need our willpower the most, it may not be there. Stanford University professor Baba Shiv's research shows just how fleeting our willpower can be. He divided 165 undergraduate students into two groups and asked them to memorize either a two-digit or a seven-digit number. Both tasks were well within the average person's cognitive abilities, and they could take as much time as they needed. When they were ready, students would then go to another room where they would recall the number. Along the way, they were offered a snack for participating in the study. The two choices were chocolate cake or a bowl of fruit salad, meaning guilty pleasure or healthy treat. Here's the kicker. Students asked to memorize the seven-digit number were nearly twice as likely to choose cake. This tiny extra cognitive load was just enough to prevent a prudent choice. The implications are staggering. The more we use our mind, the less minding power we have. Willpower is like a fast twitch muscle that gets tired and needs rest. It's incredibly powerful, but it has no endurance. As Kathleen Voss put it in Prevention Magazine in 2009, willpower is like gas in your car. When you resist something tempting, you use some up. The more you resist, the emptier your tank gets until you run out of gas. In fact, a measly five extra digits is all it takes to drain our willpower dry. While decisions tap our willpower, the food we eat is also a key player in our level of willpower. Food for thought. The brain makes up one-fiftieth of our body mass, but consumes a staggering one-fifth of the calories we burn for energy. If your brain were a car, in terms of gas mileage, it'd be a Hummer. Most of our conscious activity is happening in our prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain responsible for focus, handling short-term memory, solving problems, and moderating impulse control. It's at the heart of what makes us human, and the center for our executive control and willpower. Here's an interesting fact. The last in, first out theory is very much at work inside our head. The most recent parts of our brain to develop are the first to suffer if there is a shortage of resources. 
older, more developed areas of the brain, such as those that regulate breathing and our nervous responses, get first helpings from our bloodstream and are virtually unaffected if we decide to skip a meal. The prefrontal cortex, on the other hand, feels the impact. Unfortunately, being relatively young in terms of human development, it's the runt of the litter come feeding time. Advanced research shows us why this matters. A 2007 article in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology detailed nine separate studies on the impact of nutrition and willpower. In one set, researchers assigned tasks that did or did not involve willpower and measured blood sugar levels before and after each task. Participants who exercised willpower showed a marked drop in the levels of glucose in the bloodstream. Subsequent studies showed the impact on performance when two groups completed one willpower-related task and then did another. Between tasks, one group was given a glass of Kool-Aid lemonade sweetened with real sugar, therefore providing a buzz. The other was given a placebo in the form of lemonade with Splenda, providing a buzz kill. The placebo group had roughly twice as many errors on the subsequent test as the sugar group. The studies concluded that willpower is a mental muscle that doesn't bounce back quickly. If you employ it for one task, there will be less power available for the next, unless you refuel. To do our best, we literally have to feed our minds, which gives new credence to the old saw, food for thought. Foods that elevate blood sugar evenly for long periods, like complex carbohydrates and proteins, become the fuel of choice for high achievers. Nothing ever achieves absolute balance. Nothing. No matter how imperceptible it might be, what appears to be a state of balance is something entirely different. An act of balancing. Viewed wistfully as a noun, balance is lived practically as a verb. Seen as something we ultimately attain, balance is actually something we constantly do. A balanced life is a myth, a misleading concept most accept as a worthy and attainable goal without ever stopping to truly consider it. I want you to consider it. I want you to challenge it. I want you to reject it. A balanced life is a lie. The idea of balance is exactly that, an idea. In philosophy, the golden mean is the moderate middle between polar extremes, a concept used to describe a place between two positions that is more desirable than one state or the other. This is a grand idea, but not a very practical one. Idealistic, but not realistic. Balance doesn't exist. This is tough to conceive, much less believe mainly because one of the most frequent laments is, I need more balance. It's a common mantra for what's missing in most lives. We hear about balance so much, we automatically assume it's exactly what we should be seeking. It's not. Purpose, meaning, significance. These are what make a successful life. Seek balance and you will most certainly live your life out of balance crisscrossing an invisible middle line as you pursue your priorities. The act of living a full life by giving time to what matters is a balancing act. Extraordinary results require focused attention and time. Time on one thing means time away from another. This makes balance impossible. The Genesis of a Myth Historically, balancing our lives is a novel privilege to even consider. For thousands of years, work was life. If you didn't work, hunt game, harvest crops, or raise livestock, you didn't live long. But things changed. Jared Diamond's Pulitzer Prize winning book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, The Fate of Human Societies, illustrates how farm-based societies that generated a surplus of food ultimately gave rise to professional specialization. It says, 12,000 years ago, everybody on Earth was a hunter-gatherer. Now, almost all of us are farmers, or else are fed by farmers. This freedom from having to forage or farm allowed people to become scholars and craftsmen. Some worked to put food on our tables, while others built the tables. 
At first, most people worked according to their needs and ambitions. The blacksmith didn't have to stay at the forge until 5 p.m. He could go home when the horse's feet were shod. Then, 19th century industrialization saw, for the first time, large numbers working for someone else. The story became one of hard-driving bosses, year-round work schedules, and lighted factories that ignored dawn and dusk. Consequently, the 20th century witnessed the start of significant grassroots movements to protect workers and limit work hours. Still, the term work-life balance wasn't coined until the mid-1980s, when more than half of all married women joined the workforce. To paraphrase Ralphie Gomery's preface in the 2005 book entitled Being Together, Working Apart, Dual Career Families and the Work-Life Balance, we went from a family unit with a breadwinner and a homemaker to one with two breadwinners and no homemaker. Anyone with a pulse knows who got stuck with the extra work in the beginning. However, by the 90s, work-life balance had quickly become a common watchword for men, too. A LexisNexis survey of the top 100 newspapers and magazines around the world shows a dramatic rise in the number of articles on the topic. From 32 in the decade from 1986 to 1996, to a high of 1,674 articles in 2007 alone. Figure 9 online at theonething.com shows the number of times the term work-life balance is mentioned in newspaper and magazine articles from 1986 through 2011. This online figure clearly illustrates how work-life balance has exploded as a topic in print media in recent years. It's probably not a coincidence that the ramp-up of technology parallels the rise in the belief that something is missing in our lives. Infiltrated space and fewer boundaries will do that. Rooted in real-life challenges, the idea of work-life balance has clearly captured our minds and imagination. Middle Mismanagement The desire for balance makes sense. Enough time for everything and everything done in time. It sounds so appealing that just thinking about it makes us feel serene and peaceful. This calm is so real that we just know it's the way life was meant to be. But it's not. If you think of balance as the middle, then out of balance is when you're away from it. Get too far away from the middle and you're living at the extremes. The problem with living in the middle is that it prevents you from making extraordinary time commitments to anything. In your effort to attend to all things, everything gets shortchanged and nothing gets its due. Sometimes this can be okay and sometimes not. Knowing when to pursue the middle and when to pursue the extremes is, in essence, the true beginning of wisdom. Extraordinary results are achieved by this negotiation with your time. The reason we shouldn't pursue balance is that the magic never happens in the middle. Magic happens at the extremes. The dilemma is that chasing the extremes presents real challenges. We naturally understand that success lies at the outer edges, but we don't know how to manage our lives while we're out there. When we work too long, eventually our personal life suffers. Falling prey to the belief that long hours are virtuous, we unfairly blame work when we say, I have no life. Often, it's just the opposite. Even if our work life doesn't interfere, our personal life itself can be so full of have-tos that we again reach the same defeated conclusion. I have no life. And sometimes, we get hit from both sides. Some of us face so many personal and professional demands that everything suffers. Breakdown imminent, we once again declare, I have no life. Just like playing to the middle, playing to the extremes is the kind of middle mismanagement that plays out all the time. It's literal proof that you are what you eat. Default Judgment one of the real challenges we have is that when our willpower is low, we tend to fall back on our default settings. Researchers Jonathan Lavav of the Stanford School of Business in California 
along with Leora Avnaim Peso and Shay Danziger of Ben Gurion University of the Negev, found a creative way to investigate this. They took a hard look at the impact of willpower on the Israeli parole system. The researchers analyzed 1,112 parole board hearings assigned to eight judges over a 10-month period, which incidentally amounted to 40% of Israel's total parole requests that period. The pace is grueling. The judges hear arguments and take about six minutes to render a decision on 14 to 35 parole requests a day, and they get only two breaks to refuel with a morning snack and a late lunch. The impact of their schedule is as spectacular as it is surprising. In the mornings and after each break, parolees' chances for being released peak at 65% and then plunge to near zero by the end of each period. Figure 8, found online at theonething.com, compares the proportion of favorable decisions in the morning break, afternoon break, and at the end of the day. You can see how favorable decisions drop throughout the day, as good decisions depend on more than just wisdom and common sense. The results are most likely tied to the mental toll of repetitive decision-making. These are big decisions for the parolees and the public at large. High stakes and the assembly line rhythm demand intense focus throughout the day. As their energy is spent, judges mentally collapse into their default choice, which doesn't turn out so well for hopeful prisoners. The default decision for a parole judge is no. When in doubt and with willpower low, the prisoner stays behind bars. And if you're not careful, your default settings may convict you too. When our willpower runs out, we all revert to our default settings. This begs the question, what are your default settings? If your willpower is dragging, will you grab the bag of carrots or the bag of chips? Will you be up for focusing on the work at hand or down for any distraction that drops in? When your most important work is done while your willpower wanes, default will define your level of achievement. Average is often the result. Give willpower the time of day. We lose our willpower not because we think about it, but because we don't. Without appreciating that it can come and go, we let it do exactly that. Without intentionally protecting it every day, we allow ourselves to go from a will and a way to no will and no way. If success is what we're after, this won't work. Think about it. There are degrees of willpower strength, like the battery indicator going from green to red. There is willpower and there is won't power. Most people bring won't power to their most important challenges without ever realizing that's what makes them so hard. When we don't think of resolve as a resource that gets used up, when we fail to reserve it for the things that matter most, when we don't replenish it when it's low, we are probably setting ourselves up for the toughest possible path to success. So how do you put your willpower to work? You think about it, pay attention to it, Respect it. You make doing what matters most a priority when your willpower is its highest. In other words, you give it the time of day it deserves. What taxes your willpower? The list of things that can tax your willpower include the following. Implementing new behaviors, filtering distractions, resisting temptation, suppressing emotion, restraining aggression, suppressing impulses, taking tests, trying to impress others, coping with fear, doing something you don't enjoy, and selecting long-term over short-term rewards. Every day without realizing it, we engage in all manner of activities that diminish our willpower. Willpower is depleted when we make decisions to focus our attention, suppress our feelings and impulses, or modify our behavior in pursuit of goals. It's like taking an ice pick and gouging a hole in our gas line. Before long, we have willpower leaking everywhere and none left to do our most important work. So like any other limited but vital resource, willpower must be managed. When it comes to willpower, timing is everything. 
You'll need your willpower at full strength to ensure that when you're doing the right thing, you don't let anything distract you or steer you away from it. Then, you need enough willpower the rest of the day to either support or avoid sabotaging what you've done. That's all the willpower you need to be successful. So if you want to get the most out of your day, do your most important work, your one thing, early before your willpower is drawn down. Since your self-control will be sapped throughout the day, use it when it's at full strength on what matters most. Your personal life requires tight counterbalancing. Whether or not to go out of balance isn't really the question. The question is, do you go short or long? In your personal life, go short and avoid long periods where you're out of balance. Going short lets you stay connected to all the things that matter most and move them along together. In your professional life, go long and make peace with the idea that the pursuit of extraordinary results may require you to be out of balance for long periods. Going long allows you to focus on what matters most, even at the expense of other lesser priorities. In your personal life, nothing gets left behind. At work, it's required. In his novel, Suzanne's Diary for Nicholas, James Patterson artfully highlights where our priorities lie in our personal and professional balancing act when he writes the following. Imagine life is a game in which you are juggling five balls. The balls are called work, family, health, friends, and integrity. And you're keeping all of them in the air. But one day you finally come to understand that work is a rubber ball. If you drop it, it will bounce back. The other four balls, family, health, friends, integrity, are made of glass. If you drop one of these, it will be irrevocably scuffed, nicked, perhaps even shattered. Life is a balancing act. The question of balance is really a question of priority. When you change your language from balancing to prioritizing, you see your choices more clearly and open the door to changing your destiny. Extraordinary results demand that you set a priority and act on it. When you act on your priority, you'll automatically go out of balance, giving more time to one thing over another. The challenge then doesn't become one of not going out of balance, for in fact you must. The challenge becomes how long you stay on your priority. To be able to address your priorities outside of work, you must be clear about your most important work priority so you can get it done. Then go home and be clear about your priorities there so you can get back to work. When you're supposed to be working, work. And when you're supposed to be playing, play. It's a weird tightrope you're walking, but it's only when you get your priorities mixed up that things fall apart. Big Ideas Think about two balancing buckets. Separate your work life and personal life into two distinct buckets. Not to compartmentalize them, just for counterbalancing. Each has its own counterbalancing goals and approaches. Counterbalance your work bucket. View work as involving a skill or knowledge that must be mastered. This will cause you to give disproportionate time to your one thing and will throw the rest of your work day, week, month, and year continually out of balance. Your work life is divided into two distinct areas. What matters most and everything else. You will have to take what matters to the extremes and be okay with what happens to the rest. Professional success requires it. Counterbalance your personal life bucket. Acknowledge that your life actually has multiple areas and that each requires a minimum of attention for you to feel that you have a life. Drop any one and you will feel the effects. This requires constant awareness. You must never go too long or too far without counterbalancing them so that they are all active areas of your life. Your personal life requires it. Start leading a counterbalanced life. Let the right things take precedence when they should and get to the rest when you can. An extraordinary life is a counterbalancing act. If you are what you repeatedly do, then achievement isn't an action you take, but a habit you forge into your life. You don't have to seek out success. 
harness the power of selected discipline to build the right habit, and extraordinary results will find you. Chapter 7 Willpower is always on will call. Patricia Cohen said, Odysseus understood how weak willpower actually is when he asked his crew to bind him to the mast while sailing past the seductive sirens. Why would you ever do something the hard way? Why would you ever knowingly get behind the eight ball, deliberately crawl between a rock and a hard place, or intentionally work with one hand tied behind your back? You wouldn't, but most people unwittingly do every day. When we tie our success to our willpower without understanding what that really means, we set ourselves up for failure, and we don't have to. Often quoted as a statement about sheer determination, the old English proverb, where there's a will, there's a way, has probably misled as many as it's helped. It just rolls off the tongue and passes so quickly through our head that few stop to hear its full meaning. Widely regarded as the singular source of personal strength, it gets misinterpreted as a cleverly phrased one-dimensional prescription for success. But for will to have its most powerful way, there's more to it than that. Construe willpower as just a call for character, and you miss its other equally essential element, which is timing. It's a critical piece. For most of my life, I never gave willpower much thought. Once I did, it captivated me. The ability to control oneself to determine one's actions is a pretty powerful idea. Base it on training, and it's called discipline. But do it because you simply can. That's raw power. The power of will. It seems so straightforward. Invoke my will and success was mine. I was on my way. Sadly, I didn't need to pack much, for it was a short trip. As I set out to impose my will against defenseless goals, I quickly discovered something discouraging, that I didn't always have willpower. One moment I had it, the next I didn't. One day it was AWOL, the next it was at my beck and call. My willpower seemed to come and go as if it had a life of its own. Building success around full strength, on-demand willpower proved unsuccessful. My initial thought was, What's wrong with me? Was I a loser? Apparently so. It seemed I had no grit, no strength of character, no inner fortitude. Consequently, I gutted it up, bore down with determination, doubled my effort, and reached a humbling conclusion. Willpower isn't on will call. As powerful as my motivation was, my willpower wasn't just sitting around waiting for my call, ready at any moment to enforce my will on anything I wanted. I was taken aback. I had always assumed that it would always be there, that I could simply access it whenever I wanted to get whatever I wanted. I was wrong. Willpower is always on will call is a lie. Most people assume willpower matters but many might not fully appreciate how critical it is to our success. One highly unusual research project revealed just how important it is. Toddler Torture In the late 60s and early 70s, researcher Walter Mischel began methodically tormenting four-year-olds at Stanford University's Bing Nursery School. More than 500 children were volunteered for the diabolical program by their own parents, many of whom would later, like millions of others, laugh mercilessly at videos of the squirming, miserable kids. The devilish experiment was called the Marshmallow Test. It was an interesting way to look at willpower. Kids were offered one of three treats, a pretzel, a cookie, or the now infamous marshmallow. The child was told that the researcher had to step away, and if he could wait 15 minutes until the researcher returned, he'd be awarded a second treat. One treat now, or two later. Michel knew they designed the test well when a few of the kids wanted to quit as soon as they explained the ground rules. Left alone with a marshmallow they couldn't eat, kids engaged in all kinds of delay strategies 
from closing their eyes, pulling their own hair, and turning away, to hovering over, smelling, and even caressing their treats. On average, kids held out less than three minutes, and only three out of ten managed to delay their gratification until the researcher returned. It was pretty apparent most kids struggled with delayed gratification. Willpower was in short supply. Initially, no one assumed anything about what success or failure in the marshmallow test might say about a child's future. That insight came about organically. Mitchell's three daughters attended Bing Nursery School, and over the next few years, he slowly began to see a pattern when he'd ask them about classmates who had participated in the experiment. Children who had successfully waited for the second treat seemed to be doing better. A lot better. Starting in 1981, Mitchell began systematically tracking down the original subjects. He requested transcripts, compiled records, and mailed questionnaires in an attempt to measure their relative academic and social progress. His hunch was correct. Willpower, or the ability to delay gratification, was a huge indicator of future success. Over the next 30-plus years, Mischel and his colleagues published numerous papers on how high delayers fared better. Success in the experiment predicted higher general academic achievement, SAT test scores that were, on average, 210 points higher, higher feelings of self-worth, and better stress management. On the other hand, low delayers were 30% more likely to be overweight, and later suffered higher rates of drug addiction. When your mother told you all good things come to those who wait, she wasn't kidding. Willpower is so important that using it effectively should be a high priority. Unfortunately, since it's not on will call, putting it to its best use requires you to manage it. Time waits for no one. My wife once told me the story of a friend of hers. The friend's mother was a school teacher and her father was a farmer. They had scrimped, saved, and done with less their entire lives in anticipation of retirement and travel. The woman fondly remembered the regular shopping trips she and her mother would take to the local fabric store, where they would pick out some fabric and patterns. The mother explained that when she retired, these would be her travel clothes. She never got to her retirement years. In her final year of teaching, she developed cancer and later died. The father never felt good about spending the money they'd saved, believing that it was their money, and now she wasn't there to share it with him. When he passed away and my wife's friend went to clean out her parents' home, she discovered a closet full of fabric and dress patterns. The father had never cleaned it out. He couldn't. It represented too much. It was as if its contents were so full of unfulfilled promises that they were too heavy to lift. Time waits for no one. Push something to an extreme and postponement can become permanent. I once knew a highly successful businessman who had worked long days and weekends for most of his life, sincere in his belief that he was doing it all for his family. Someday when he was done, they would all enjoy the fruits of his labor, spend time together, travel and do all the things they'd never done. After giving many years to building his company, he had recently sold it and was open to discussing what he might do next. I asked him how he was doing and he proudly proclaimed that he was fine. When I was building the business, I was never home and rarely saw my family, so now I'm with them on vacation making up for lost time. You know how it is, right? Now that I have the money and the time, I'm getting those years back. Do you really think you can ever get back a child's bedtime story or birthday? Is a party for a five-year-old with imaginary pals the same as dinner with a teenager with high school friends? Is an adult attending a young child's soccer game on par with attending a soccer game with an adult child? Do you think you can cut a deal with God that time stands still for you? Holding off on anything important until you're ready to participate again? When you gamble with your time, you may be placing a bet you can't cover. Even if you're sure you can win, be careful that you can live with what you lose. Toying with time will lead you down a rabbit hole with no way out. Believing this lie does its harm by convincing you to do things you shouldn't and stop doing things you should. 
Middle mismanagement can be one of the most destructive things you ever do. You can't ignore the inevitability of time. So if achieving balance is a lie, then what do you do? You counterbalance. Replace the word balance with counterbalance, and what you experience makes sense. The things we presume to have balance are really just counterbalancing. The ballerina is a classic example. When the ballerina poses on pointe, she can appear weightless, floating on air, the very idea of balance and grace. A closer look would reveal her toe shoes vibrating rapidly, making minute adjustments for balance. Counterbalancing, done well, gives the illusion of balance. Counterbalancing, the long and short of it. When we say we're out of balance, we're usually referring to a sense that some priorities, things that matter to us, are being underserved or unmet. The problem is that when you focus on what is truly important, something will always be underserved. No matter how hard you try, there will always be things left undone at the end of your day, week, month, year, and life. Trying to get them all done is folly. When the things that matter most get done, you'll still be left with a sense of things being undone, a sense of imbalance. Leaving some things undone is a necessary trade-off for extraordinary results. But you can't leave everything undone, and that's where counterbalancing comes in. The idea of counterbalancing is that you never go so far that you can't find your way back, or stay so long that there is nothing waiting for you when you return. This is so important that your very life may hang in the balance. An 11-year study of nearly 7,100 British civil servants concluded that habitual long hours can be deadly. Researchers showed that individuals who work more than 11 hours a day, that's a 55-plus hour work week, were 67% more likely to suffer from heart disease. Counterbalancing is not only about your sense of well-being, it's essential to your being well. There are two types of counterbalancing the balancing between work and personal life, and the balancing within each. In the world of professional success, it's not about how much overtime you put in. The key ingredient is focused time over time. To achieve an extraordinary result, you must choose what matters most and give it all the time it demands. This requires getting extremely out of balance in relation to all other work issues with only infrequent counterbalancing to address them. In your personal world, awareness is the essential ingredient. Awareness of your spirit and body, awareness of your family and friends, awareness of your personal needs. None of these can be sacrificed if you intend to have a life, so you can never forsake them for work or one for the other. You can move back and forth quickly between these and often even combine the activities around them but you can't neglect any of them for long. The Big Bad Wolf, Big Bad John. From folk tales to folk songs, the suggestion that big and bad go together has been a common theme across history, so much so that many think they're synonymous. They're not. Big can be bad, and bad can be big, but they're not one and the same. They aren't inherently related. A big opportunity is better than a small one, but a small problem is better than a big one. Sometimes you want the biggest present under the tree, and sometimes you want the smallest. Often a big laugh or a big cry is just what you need, and every so often a small chuckle and a few tears will do the trick. Big and bad are no more tied together than small and good. Big is bad is a lie. It's quite possibly the worst lie of all. For if you fear big success, you'll either avoid it or sabotage your efforts to achieve it. Who's afraid of the big bad big? Place big and results in the same room and a lot of people balk or walk. Mention big with achievement and their first thoughts are hard, complicated and time-consuming, difficult to get there and complex once you do pretty much sums up their views. Overwhelming and intimidating is what they feel. 
For some reason, there is the fear that big success brings crushing pressure and stress, that the pursuit of it robs them of not only time with family and friends, but eventually their health. Uncertain of the right to achieve big, or fearful of what might happen if they try and fall short, their head spins just thinking about it, and they immediately doubt they have a head for heights. All of this reinforces a dis-ease with the very idea of big. To invent a word, call it megaphobia. That's the irrational fear of big. When we connect big with bad, we trigger shrinking thinking. Lowering our trajectory feels safe. Staying where we are feels prudent. But the opposite is true. When big is believed to be bad, small thinking rules the day, and big never sees the light of it. Flat wrong. How many ships didn't sail because of the belief that the earth was flat? How much progress was impeded because man wasn't supposed to breathe underwater, fly through the air, or venture into outer space? Historically, we've done a remarkably poor job of estimating our limits. The good news is that science isn't about guessing, but rather the art of progressing. And so is your life. None of us knows our limits. Borders and boundaries may be clear on a map, but when we apply them to our lives, the lines aren't so apparent. I was once asked if I thought thinking big was realistic. I paused to reflect on this and then said, let me ask you a question first. Do you know what your limits are? They replied, no. So I said that it seemed the question was irrelevant. No one knows their ultimate ceiling for achievement, so worrying about it was a waste of time. What if someone told you that you could never achieve above a certain level, that you were required to pick an upper limit which you could never exceed? What would you pick, a low one or a high one? I think we know the answer. Put in this situation, we would all do the same thing. We would go big. Why? Because you wouldn't want to limit yourself. When you allow yourself to accept that big is about who you can become, you look at it differently. In this context, big is a placeholder for what you might call a leap of possibility. It's the office intern visualizing the boardroom, or a penniless immigrant imagining a business revolution. It's about bold ideas that might threaten your comfort zones, but simultaneously reflect your greatest opportunities. Believing in big frees you to ask different questions, follow different paths, and try new things. This opens the doors to possibilities that until now only lived inside you. Sabir Bhatia arrived in America with only $250 in his pocket, but he wasn't alone. Sabir came with big plans and the belief that he could grow a business faster than any business in history. And he did. He created Hotmail. Microsoft, a witness to Hotmail's meteoric rise, eventually bought it for $400 million. According to his mentor, Farooq Arjuni, Sabir's success was directly related to his ability to think big. Arjuni says, what sets Sabir apart from hundreds of entrepreneurs I've met is the gargantuan size of his dream. Even before he had a product, before he had money behind him, he was completely convinced that he was going to build a major company that would be worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He had an unrelenting conviction that he was not just going to build a run-of-the-mill Silicon Valley company, but over time, I realized by golly, he was probably going to pull it off. As of 2011, Hotmail ranked as one of the most successful webmail service providers in the world, with more than 360 million active users. Going big. Thinking big is essential to extraordinary results. Success requires action, and action requires thought. But here's the catch. The only actions that become springboards to succeeding big are those informed by big thinking to begin with. Make this connection and the importance of how big you think begins to sink in. Everyone has the same amount of time and hard work is simply hard work. As a result, what you do in the time you work 
determines what you achieve. And since what you do is determined by what you think, how big you think becomes the launching pad for how high you achieve.